Good afternoon and welcome to the British Library, which is currently home to a very topical exhibition called Breaking the News, which takes an in-depth look at 500 years of news in the UK right up to the present day. In this event today, however, we're looking beyond that UK focus with some British Library curators who are going to share their hand-picked choices from their respective regions that speak to the themes of the exhibition. This will also give us a sneak peek behind the curating scenes, something I'm really keen on doing. Um, the British Library is full of such interesting people. Uh, and this is your chance to find out what curators do all day, what makes a particular item stand out and anything else you'd like to know. So please don't wait till the end. You can just put your questions in the chat box anytime and we'll have a Q&A after my colleagues' presentations. I'm Bea Rolat of the Cultural Events team, and it's my great pleasure to introduce to you some of my exceptional colleagues, today's British Library All-Stars. We have Yasuo Otsuka, who's Jap um, curator of Japanese collections, Han Lin Shi, who's curator of Chinese collections, Ayob Dorillo is curator for the Ethiopia collection and Mariam Dehan is curator of Africa collections. Our first two speakers are a joint presentation that very cleverly shows the same story from two completely different sides. Um, so Yasio, I'm going to let you take over now. Thank you very much. So is everyone can see the, yes, there is a slide that's coming up, okay. Hello everyone, thank you very much for coming to our event. I'm Yasu Yotsuka, Curator Japanese Collection. Today uh, we are going to present the, the uh, presentation with my colleague Han Lin Xie, Curator Chinese Collection. The title of our presentation is Was A Real? Fake News Is Nothing New. So what we are going to do is we, we are going to present two prints depicted the same event of the Sino-Japanese war propaganda print under the, with the strong political bias from a Japanese point of view and Chinese point of view. So we are going to show you two prints from Japan and from China. Next one, please. Okay. First of all, I would like to explain you a little bit about our Sino-Japanese war print in the British Museum. In total, we have 235 prints and 179 printed in Japan by Japanese artists and 56 printed in China by Chinese artists. All the prints were acquired by the British Museum between April and October 1895. This timing is quite important because this is not long after prints were produced. And then we think that was the evidence of the British Museum because um, these prints were important visual record of international conflict. Next slide, please. So what is Sino-Japanese War? Sino-Japanese War was between 1894 to 1895. And it was broke out in July, 1894. So, it was the in military rivalry between major Japan and China. So it was back, back. It's a, it's on the bridge point is the major Japan vs China. It is resulting, and this battle was resulting from political turbulence in Korea under the rule of Yi Dynasty. So the name of the war, we, it was widely known, Sino-Japanese War, but actually battlefield was Korean Peninsula. So I'm going to hand over to Han Lin, as she's going to explain about the, the battle. Thank you, Yasuo, for the quick introductions to the Sino-Japanese War. And now I'm going to give a little bit more background of the things that we are going to talk about is the battle of Jiu Lian Chen, Jiu Lian cities. If we go to click on the map, then we can see where the Jiu Lian city is located. As you can see, it's more North China and near to the Korea as uh, Yasuya just explained where the main battlefield was. 
a little bit about the story behind why uh, this battle and how it uh, went on. So the story is um, from the Chinese side, the uh, general, two generals, General Song Qing and General Liu Shenshou. Both of them didn't really get well. And so the order didn't go through smoothly. If we click a bit of, then we can see these two generals. Actually, they, as I just mentioned, they are not getting uh, well. Therefore, the orders from the main general song didn't uh, really get through. And then General Liu didn't uh, get the main order and didn't follow. So as a result, General Liu didn't went to the Julian city and protect the cities. In this case, the Japanese army, General Yamagata Aritomo, he took the cities on 24th of October. So the Japanese took the cities. Next slide, please. A little bit fact, uh, conclude facts of these battles is uh, Japanese army fully prepared to attack this city. However, the Qing Dynasty uh, army had already left the city as I just explained the reason why. Therefore, the very important fact to remember is Japanese army took the city without fighting. And Qing Dynasty army didn't retake the city. This is two main points that uh, need to remember. Next slide, please. And now I hand back to Yasuya yep. to Thank describe you. a bit more about the Japanese items. Thank you very much. This is a Japanese print produced by Japanese art, um, Japanese artist and the Japanese publisher. So you can see the title of this print is the Japanese army occupied Julian Gem. We made a great victory. So this is a battle scene of the Imperial Japanese army fighting heroically. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the distance, you can see the triangle flag. It, it, that is indicate where the Chinese army was fighting against the Japanese army. But as Han Lin has just explained, it never happened. Because when Japanese army approached to the Julian Chen, the Julian Chen was empty because Qin Dynasty's um, army had already gone. So this has never ever happened. So that's why we think this is a truly purely produced, produced under the propaganda purpose to advertise how Japanese army was doing great job and how bravely they were and uh, kind of the heroic moment. To say about the Imperial Japan is great, but it never happened, please remember this never happened. So this is a fake news. So handing over to Han Lin to explain about the Chinese print. Okay, so right now you can see from the Japanese items depict uh, the other uh, historical events, but which as well is not happened and not real. There are a few hints on these prints also provide the evidence that these things didn't happen. So the first one on the title in Chinese is Ke Fu. In English, we can translate it as retake. However, as in the archive and recordings, there is no these events happened. Chinese didn't retake the Julian cities. And the second, so Da Niao Hui Jie in Chinese, uh, Otori Kesuke, this name has been mentioned in the print. However, this gentleman who was a high ranking diploma was in Japan during the time. Therefore, how could he um, join the war? Therefore, this is the second point that this thing is not true. And then the third, 
you can see there are a bit descriptions on the left hand side. And according to the historical re recordings, there is no such um, descriptions. Therefore, these three points gives the hints that this is a propaganda purpose printings, which depicts a non happened event. Next slide, please. Therefore, uh, what we do with these prints? So as curators, we carry out the research on the collections and do the research on uh, various archival records. Next steps, we provide the resources as you might receive the link for uh, online websites that provide the resource, including the British Library's items and some archive and recordings. This website was worked together with our Japanese partners, Japanese Center for Asian Historical Re Records. So we also worked with our partners to provide the resources to the general public. The last step is we will leave the public to interpret. Therefore, in conclude, as curator and the library, will, we provide the items available to the public and we leave the interpretations to them. This is our presentation as our part. If you have any questions, you can put your questions into Q&A box. And now I'm hand over to my colleagues, Ayo, who will introduce the Ethiopian items to you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, as you have seen um, in this exhibition, Breaking News, um, in 1984, uh, very important coverage of the Ethiopian famine was made by uh, Mohamed Amin and Michael Burke. Um, this reporting of the Ethiopian famine uh, inspired Band-Aid um, to raise charity records uh, money, as well as being considered one of the most um, regarded as being um, a watershed moment in crisis reporting, which to this day um, had a great influence. At that time, um, the Ethiopian government was a communist government, which just came to power in 1976. And the famine was considered in Ethiopia as, um, as a cause by the, the, the civil war. And important newspapers and articles at that time were produced, uh, as well as posters, to basically celebrate the first couple of years of the revolution, I think four or five years. And what that did was it created a great um, criticism, especially from um, outside of Ethiopia. Um, next slide, please. Um, because, so just to give you some background before I go into our main um, poster, that propaganda poster that I've, uh, that I've chosen for this talk. Um, the first picture that you saw is actually is from the Library of Congress, which is a um, communist poster, again, produced between 1984. So the British Library has a vast amount of collections of items relating to Ethiopia. One of the areas that's hasn't had a great attention that much as opposed to manuscripts is um, the modern printed books and particularly um, communist magazines and newspapers uh, and books of that period. Next slide, please. So I selected this, um, as you can see, uh, uh, a poster in a newspaper. This was for a special edition for a newspaper titled Sartodder, um, which, literally translates um, work, the, the, the workers uh, produced by the Workers' um, Party of Ethiopia. And this was, again, uh, part of the celebration of the first couple of decades um, of the Ethiopian revolution. And important artists were commissioned to produce um, posters like this. This was particularly for the May Day um, festival that it was um, produced. As you can see, um, the color used, interestingly enough, uh, it's the red and black, which 
is of course symbol of the red flag being um, of, of the flag of the communists. But at the same time, red and black were cheaper to produce on on, on newspaper. <laughs> um, so the newspaper basically that this 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 poster that you see reads 1979. Actually, Ethiopia has a different calendar. We 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 don't we we follow um, different calendar. So we are six years or seven years back. So you will be seven years younger if you go to Ethiopia. Um, so this poster has the word um, 1979, but it has a very interesting. If uh, you know, if looked at carefully, it you know it's there's the English writing that says "Long live May Day," um, and then at the Bottom, um, it read Masarat for defeat, which is we should go forward. Um, and then it has Ullum Abiyotawi and Natagar Zabyukum, all must stand for the mother, um, revolutionary motherland of, um, of our country. I'm just trying to attempt to do um, a direct translation. Above that, it reads very interestingly, it reads. It says to be self-sustained um, yourself in terms of food, be strong and work hard for your country. Now, this is a period where I said there was a great famine and great civil war. Um, so this kind of posture were, was produced, interestingly enough, not by the government itself, but although the government was the Workers' Party. Um, they attempted to show uh, a positive image of Ethiopia, um, and of course of the workers, and a promise of a new, a promise of a new future, despite um, of what was going on. Until the end of the Cold War, posters like this and newspapers, and especially printed books, uh, were an important tool uh, in both legitimizing the dictatorship, the communist dictatorship then, uh, along with justifying again censorship uh, because people weren't able to discuss um, what was happening openly. Uh, so this, this, this posters did uh, legitimize that. But another positive aspect of such posters, which I'm not able really to show you here uh, since they haven't been photographed yet, were also communicating public health. During the famine, many illnesses uh, such as Corolla and uh, uh, other illnesses uh, emerged and these posters were again effective in communicating um, communicating this um, important issues in, a, in a sort of in a broader sense. Now the aim of all propaganda poster is obviously influencing and in this case what they're trying to do is in trying to influence people that the, um, towards the communist cause which was you know this is a short-lived revolution therefore don't give up. This is one message this is sending, uh, and, it, and it's also international, despite uh, the famine. Um, just to conclude, posters like this and newspapers have become incredibly rare and extremely expensive. The British Library was um, fortunate, um, as my predecessor did collect a number of these newspapers. Roughly, uh, we have about seven Seven or, uh, seven, 70 or 80 newspapers of that period with uh, amazing posters and um, important books like this. They reveal a lot about the social um, period, uh, the social history of that period, which now has become completely uh, ignored and forgotten. If you go to the next slide, I'll quickly uh, give you an example of some of these posters, which were again produced in that communist period. The poster you see on the left was actually, uh, sorry, the newspaper you see on your, my left, or your, probably your right, your left, um, is uh, an important newspaper that was published in the 1940s, um, which commemorated um, people that were killed during the Ethiopian uh, Italian occupation of Ethiopia, the, the, the massacre. So we have these examples and they are also available uh, on microfilm. They've been um, microfilmed. They have important, like I said, social history. And if we go to the next slide, other important books, as I mentioned to you, are these communist books. Um, they, are, they were all produced between the beginning of the 19. 73 to 1984, and they were mostly 
important translations of communist workers. For example, this one um, on my right-hand side, Ersha Socialist Lot, A Revolution Through Farming, which was um, written by Lenin, so they were translation. Um, we have around 90 of these books, so probably about 100, and I've just finished writing an article on this, which should soon will be published. If we go to the next slide. Another important example where in books we have um, a re re reproduction of old communist poster, and then on the left-hand side, uh, that yellow book is titled uh, Ethiopia Tikkadam, which was a novel um, written about the, um, the revolution. Next slide, please. Um, that's my conclusion. Thank you very much. And now I hand you over to my colleague, uh, Mario. So, uh, hello, uh, my name is Mariam Dehan, and I am the curator of the African Collections. Um, and the item that I have chosen to present to you today is a, a item, a book called uh, Frozen Chicken Trainwreck by Lawrence Hamburger. It was published in Johannesburg, South Africa in 2013. So I chose quite a contemporary item uh, to present to you today. Um, it is a collection of South African tabloid posters, um, and these tabloid posters were collected by the author from uh, 2008 till 2013. The goal was to preserve these posters because they are funny, they are clever, and they are true, as the author said. Um, and also on top of that, um, because these uh, posters are not archived by the newspapers themselves. Instead, these posters exist within Johannesburg for one day and they are placed on electricity poles, like we can see in the center image, um, which the author took on Lewis Botha Avenue in Johannesburg, where they live. Um, one of the interesting things about this uh, book is that as we flick through it, it shows how sensational and how outlandish headlines can be. Um, but at the same time, it shows an alternative history of the city. Uh, so most of these uh, headlines come from political sound bites, public innuendos and hard bitter truths. So for example, we have, um, on the left, uh, an image from the Sowetan, uh, it's a tabloid poster where the headline is, I saw Mama Africa collapse. Uh, and uh, to the right, we have one uh, that says all blacks are brilliant. And this is from the Times and was from December 1st, 2009. And when you look at all these uh, tabloid posters, they show Again, an alternative history, and at the same time, um, while you're there and also having known about uh, that time period, you learn a little bit more about the sort of uh, politics and at the same time, the cultural happenings that are happening within the city. At the same time, it shows a local vernacular, which is Shabin English, which is spoken in Johannesburg. Um, and it shows um, how that local vernacular is presented by the news and how it's presented by newspapers. Um, it should be noted that because these posters are so widely available and because they are so, part, so much part of the urban fabric, when you're walking through the city of Johannesburg, you see these posters. When you're driving through the city of Johannesburg, you see these posters and it really becomes part of uh, the city itself. Um, and as one editor to a newspaper put it, the posters are the perfect marriage of co a corrupted society and a progressive constitution. Next slide, please. Now, uh, when we're looking at this in relation to the Breaking News exhibition, um, we see the same sort of, the same kind of sensational and outlandish headlines uh, within this book as we see um, both within the breaking news exhibition and at the same time within our own daily lives when we're looking at news. Um, at the same time, we start to question whether um, these tabloid posters, whether they are uh, an example of something that is reported or something that is distorted. For example, um, the central image and the central tabloid poster by The Citizen, which was published in, on the 19th of September, 2012, 
um, it says that cops were trained to slay vampires. Now, for people who are not part of that, uh, not part of that uh, culture, not part of Johannesburg, and not part of that time period, it may be a question of is vampire something within Shabin English, or is something uh, is it a slang term, uh, or is it something that had occurred at that time? Um, and these are the sort of questions where you start to ask yourself. Uh, or, for example, Karate Goat hates me. People who, uh, as as somebody who doesn't, who isn't part of that time period, we may not understand who Karate Goat is. And at the same time, we may not understand whether this is an actual reporting or a, a sort of distorted headline. Um, and at the same time, within this uh, book, when you flick through, you realize that there is a focus on sex and the scandal. So, for example, one of the ones that I found was quite comedic uh, was uh, this, uh, the left image from uh, the Daily Sun, where it says that a goat was caught in a sex scandal. Um, and when you look through this entire book, you see time and time again, the sort of comedic humor that we have. And uh, finally, in, in conclusion, these posters might be unique to Johannesburg and South Africa, but the concept of an almost absurd headline is not. And it really makes us contemplate the headlines that we consume and how they seem almost insane in a way. So that's the item that I wanted to present to you today. Thank you so much, Mariam. That was absolutely fascinating. And indeed, all of these presentations took us right into the core themes of the Breaking the News exhibition with the fake news, the propaganda, sensationalism, and it just shows what um, a global enterprise those themes are. So thank you all very much. I'd like you to switch your cameras back on now, please. Um, and we'll see if there are any questions from the audience. I don't think there are. Um, but that's fine because I've got some of my own. Mariam, I'd like to start with you, please. Um, your comment that headlines are funny, clever and true. I must say everything right now certainly does feel like a frozen chicken train wreck. Um, but in the sense that tabloids are a, a, a barometer of public mood and the politics of a given time, I just wondered, is there other information, sort of meta information that you garner from these items? For example, um, the advertising, the, the price, the pricing schemes, who the writers are, are these details also part of your research? So when you're looking at uh, the tabloid posters, well, specifically this item um, that Lawrence Humberger uh, created uh, and frozen chicken train wreck is also one of the headlines, by the way. Um, uh, but when you're looking at that item, you do see that um, the tabloid posters are quite cheap. Um, and at the same time, they're displayed uh, in the city all throughout. So. Um, in terms of headlines, they're free to consume. And at the same time, because um, somebody who is out of that time period and out of that cultural uh, situation may not fully understand what was going on at that time. But somebody who is there, they understand, oh, this is this is what's going on. This is what the, the poster and the headline is saying, even though they are outlandish and they seem even more outlandish to us because we're not part of that time period. Um, so with with your question on um, whether it's easy to consume, then, yeah, it's, it's very easy because they're all free for anybody who's walking by, anybody who's driving by to read. And uh, the newspapers themselves are quite uh, quite inexpensive, where one of the newspapers actually had the price of just three rand. So yeah, uh, three South African rand. So they are actually quite cheap, yeah. Oh, in, a, in a sense, a very sort of democratic form of, of information sharing, which yeah. brings me to um, Han Lin. I'd like to ask you a question. Um, thank you for um, setting out the, the flow of, of how items become in, enter the public domain. Um, I just wondered, Han Lin, could you talk about, uh, you said, uh, I like the phrase, allowing the audience to make its own interpretation. Can you talk about how your work democratizes the collections held within the British Library? 
Um, so it's your questions that how we interpreted the items were how you facilitate others' interpretations more, really. What What is its journey from being sort of locked away in a safe, dark, you know, very careful space? How, how do you widen that access and, and democratise the item? Uh, okay, right. So um, so it will come to, like, various items in the libraries. So um, maybe the public may not know, as the library in the Chinese collections, we do have various materials of the collections. It's not only books. We also have these printings. We also have some um, manuscripts and some special items. So how we make those uh, items uh, for the public, easiest way is um, the, pop, uh, the audience and the public can come to the libraries, apply the reader pass, and you can request those materials to be read in the reading rooms. Although this... Do you mind if I just jump in? Because some of my friends didn't know how easy it is to get a reader pass. And I just <laughs> like to make sure that you don't have to be an academic or anybody at all. All you need is a phone bill and an address to come in and get a reader's pass. And I just had to um to just barge in there. Apologies for interrupting. Just no, to be sure that don't worry. Don't, yes. So uh, SB just say it's, it, it, it is not difficult to get a reader pass. And as long as you get a reader pass, you can access to the library's reading rooms. Then you can access to this material as like the treasures. So it's not secure to academic or only the curators can access it. So the simplest way is to consult the materials uh, in the reading rooms. Second, of course, as just I said, it might subject to the conditions of the items, but don't worry and don't disappoint it. You always can contact to the curators, provide your purpose of research, and we can evaluate if you um, it's uh, you can see the original items uh, or not subject to the conditions of the items. The third step is uh, what the library at the moment also pursue is to make our collections online. So we also under ca uh, carry on many uh, digitization projects to digitize our materials and put it online. So the audience or the public can access to the high resolution image all over the world, no matter when you are, as like 3 p 3 a.m. in the morning or 3 a.m. in the afternoon for a cup of tea. So no matter where you are and what time zone you are, you can access those uh, images online. Furthermore, we also have uh, a couple of events. For example, today's uh, events, thank you for organizing the and cultural events teams. So for the, uh, these kind of small events, we also promote uh, our collections to let the public know we have um, these kind of treasures. Also, we quite frequently will publish our blog posts on the British Library's blog post channels. We also use these um, ways to promote uh, our collections to let the public know. Uh, sometimes we also undertake uh, carry out the show and tells for the specific uh, target audience, for example, students from the universities. And I just remember for uh, from the library, we host the PhD open day to introduce our collections to the PhD students. So as <laughs> uh, I just uh, described as many uh, steps and from different perspectives or different directions, how you want to access the materials, the library did provide quite a lot of channels 
to that's, that's very helpful so any, <laughs> if anyone was wondering what curators do all day now we have a much <laughs> better idea of that um one of our audience has just shared a question um it says here we have curators with a focus on china japan ethiopia and africa countries at a whole continent i was curious how this was approached within the library it's a very good question you're talking about editorial balance of how we've attempted to cover this region the truth is, uh, dear audience, that it's really a question of who was available and we've sadly lost one of our speakers today. So um, it's not uh, a sense of really editorialising the importance of certain regions as, a, as opposed to others, but really which of our curators was able to, to share their time and join us today. I hope that that's an adequate answer for you. And uh, please do remember there's another session next week uh, covering different regions with um, different curators. Uh, moving on to another question, I'd like to ask you, Yasuo, uh, your demonstration showed that fake news is nothing new. And it led me to wonder, has there ever been a hoax item or a fake in our collections? Or um, have you had to authenticate or verify an item? Well, This time, um, the title of fake news or fake items, um, we have chosen the title especially for this event because this is um, um, con uh, this is connected to the main uh, exhibition at the breaking news. So it's not, it, it depends on how you describe what is fake. So we have the facsimile of the antiquarian material that facsimile, do we say it's a fake or not? And um, when the facsimile was created with the purpose of the preservation of the real item, that facsimile is not fake because that has a purpose. And we know um, it was facsimile. It's a very similar copy. And we say to the user, this is a facsimile because the real item is in the fragile condition, something like that. Well, um, you asked Handin about our um, prints, and Handin explained them um, uh, briefly how we treat the items. Well, I would like to back up what Handin was saying. Especially this type of the propaganda poster is difficult to handle at the library because we do not want to give the user as a misunderstanding as um, we are actively collecting propaganda poster for the for the for the sake of scattering the propaganda to the world no that is not our purpose so how do you manage that because that, that there is a, a, an editorial line to be yeah. balanced there isn't yes, there how do you how do you add that context well so that's why we did the online exhibition with our japanese partner uh, Handy mentioned the name of the Japanese partner. It say it's the Japanese Center for the Japanese Japan Center for Asian Historical Record. So, in short words, they were digital branch of the National Archive of Japan, and specific to treat the time span of the 19th century to 20th century. So, first of all. Our Sino Japanese war print has a good balance of Chinese prints and Japanese prints together. And it came to the British Museum together. And we, we know the evidence when it was purchased from a London bookseller. So, so that's why we thought, aha, and that the British Museum thought that was a visual aid material to know about the political conflict in the Far East, then they are aware that it's a print, propaganda print. So somehow um, those prints was given the shelf mark as a Japanese collection, not the Chinese collection, and also not the visual art or print collection as the British Museum. So that's why when British Museum and the British Library was physically completely separated, the collection was transferred from the British Museum to the British Library. Then, 1994, 
um, British Library, it's still physically not completely, completely separated from the British Museum. But I wanted to do the bit of the tiny showcase of the King's Library or King's Corridor for a moment in the British Museum, 1994. That time, we didn't have technology to print two byte languages, i.e., Chinese script or Japanese script. So having the exhibition with only for the um, Romanized Chinese or Romanized Japanese with English text, it was tough because the tourists come to the King's Gallery and say, oh, you are putting the propaganda poster and that your explanation was wrong. Mm. So it was a bit of the bitter experience we had. So that's why we jointly, um, we set up the joint project with our Japanese partner on 2016. It was a long time before any other my colleagues sitting here joined to the library. <laughs> so, and uh, what we did was we digitalized all the print and put onto the gallery, everything on the gallery, and uh, have got a bit of the topics like a Julian change incident or other incident. Compare and contrast the same event in Chinese, Japanese, plus digital archival document from a Japanese partner to say, this is a fact, as the Japanese archive was saying, this is the images. Then we are the resource holder and provide the resources from online or website. So anyone from all over the world, all over the world 24 hours access. So that is a way to provide the information. And as Handy mentioned, okay, this is the resources. Here you are, you use it you study it and you research it, we are the resource holder, we are happy to share with you. Thank you so yeah. much. That was a really fascinating backstory and, and also such a, a sort of long train of collaborative work that's, that's, that's led to this moment. Quite appropriate that you presented it in, a, in collaboration. So thank you. Eob, I'd like to come to you now, please. Um, I thought your presentation was just brilliant. Uh, I'm particularly interested in your own little bit of propaganda that you sneaked in there that we're all seven years younger in Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, um, you know, the very striking, bold Soviet styled imagery, um, and then all of the many layers of meaning and messaging that you that you unpeeled from that. I thought was fascinating. You suggested at one point that there are many more that haven't yet been digitized. Is this a is this a new part of the collection? Um. So just uh, just to answer the, the the question that the gentleman um, the person asked regarding um, uh, the collection, he says uh, we have curators focus on Japan, Ethiopia, and Africa. Uh, ju just to point out that we actually are we work with the languages, so we're not really a curator of uh, you know China or Japan, but we work with specifically with the languages. Um, so the way the libraries is is is, uh, is 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 established is is based on the collection. So you have people working on Latin, Greek, um, and when exhibitions like this come up, curators organizing the exhibition they usually approach us to ask us what material do we have within that that, that language. Um, and to answer your point, um, so. In terms of digitizing this material, they're not really a priority, and there is a long, you know, sort of long wait to, to uh, digitize uh, important manuscripts and early printed books. Um, these items, the way they came in was some of them were through donation, um, most were acquired by the library. Um, not much focus was given on these printed materials because people because people were really interested in ancient Ethiopian manuscripts, uh, linguists. Um, and when the library was established, as I said before, it's it's a language-based collection that we have. Um, most scholars were really working on uh, manuscripts and um, early sort of printed books. And that's That's the reason why it never had, but to make it a priority, maybe when my article comes out, I could try to persuade my boss. So tell us more about the article. So my article focuses on this kind of collection within the British Library. So the communist uh, books, and in particular, 
novels like Tolstoy's work that were translated uh, into the Ethiopian um, Amharic language. So it's the first um, article to just do it, to um, not just attempt, but to kind of uh, call people to start taking this material really um, in, seriously. And when can we read this? Is, it, is this going to be a curator's blog? No, this will be a peer-reviewed journal, which will be hopefully published by the Institute of Ethiopian Studies. Uh, they just keep sending me proofs after proofs, and uh, <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of work. But I hope to turn it into a blog one. Uh, well, I can tell by the enthusiastic nods of your colleagues that we're we're all very much looking forward to reading that. You suggested, though, that there, there is a queue of materials waiting to be digitized. And, and how does that work? So we, I mean, at the, at the library for the Ethiopian collection, um, we were fortunate enough to secure a granting aid in 2017 to digitize um, important sets of 300 Ethiopian manuscripts that were acquired in 1868. Um, the way it works is basically the library prioritized digitization firstly uh, on the basis of the material, fragility, and how rare it is. Um, and, uh, and previously, the library also had to seek funding from outside to have those, uh, such as the Hebrew manuscript projects, for example, is a good example, uh, where um, it's been helped, uh, we've been aided by um, the Pronsky Foundation. Um, so priority really is based on, and the importance of work. So, you know, it's a huge library with um, a lot of important collections. So you have the Magna Carta and you have many, many um, treasures within the library that, uh, you know, that, that are really important and should be digitized and sometimes deciding um, what to digitize is also uh, not that easy. You have to work with scholars, you have to work with communities. Um, in my case, I did get a feedback from the Ethiopian community what item they would like to be digitized. Um, can, can you talk us through? I'm really fascinated by that process because there is a sort of almost, when you're in the British Library, it's almost overwhelming just the idea that every book ever published, you know, there's so many sound archives, um, almost where to begin. Um, and so I'm fascinated by that, the, the idea of um, it being an interactive process where you, you speak to communities. Can, can you tell us a bit about how you went about that? Yeah, so basically the, so the role of curator is very, um, misleading sometimes and sometimes partly accurate and sometimes not accurate because the, the title is a hangover from the British Museum when we were part of the British Museum. Um, we are, you know, at one point uh, specialist, subject language specialist, and we are curators because our main fundamental role, well, important roles are to make the collection visible. And as Yasua and Hanlin emphasized, is actually going out there and telling people we have this collection by writing or giving talks or um, blogs. And, and the second important thing is also to make, to develop the collection. Um, again, in the case of um, other departments, which acquire more material than, um, than, than my section, um, developing the collection is key. Um, then safeguarding the collection. So a lot of uh, good example is the difference between the material I showed you and the material handling and Yosua showed you, because mine is newspaper. It's not a high grade material where um, a conservation will be required to look after it uh, or examine it, like the one that you see with Yasuo, which is digitized and it went through sort of conservation treatment because you can't just you know, handle it. So there is, in that case, we do, we are as like museum curators as well. Um, and the other final thing is making the collection widely accessible. We do this through cataloging, um, either uh, cataloging of printed books or cataloging of, of, um, of archive materials or cataloging um, manuscripts. 
And I completely forgot your question because I just went into <laughs> definition of a curator. <laughs> so. I think I think you answered about 17 questions there. So that, that, I'm very happy with that. Don't worry. Um, we yeah. have got a very quiet audience. I, you know, audience, you're making me work really hard here. <laughs> Come on, audience. I'm sure you're all very well informed and have lots of questions at the back of your mind. But in the absence of further audience questions, I'm just going to throw one more out. And this is for all of you. Um, so anybody just switch off your microphone. What was the hardest part of being a curator? For me, I, I go, this is very easy for me, beside many other things. But the most hardest thing is when we are contacted to identify items. Sometimes you, you know, books from Ethiopia or manuscripts. And sometimes we receive languages we don't know. I've received even, uh, you know, manuscripts with Greek lost texts, or it could even be to um, Tolkien's uh, um, writing. So that's one for me. Interesting. Well, never a dull moment, I'm sure. Mariam, what would yours be? Yeah, I have to agree with you. Um, so because I work with an entire continent, but thankfully Eup works with Ethiopia. <laughs> Um, and we also do have, uh, so I am the curator of the Africa, but south of the Sahara. So we also have the curator of the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, those are put together to also clarify for the person who asked about that. Um, but yeah, one of, I, I have to say, one of the challenging things is that we receive uh, items in all these different languages. Um, I speak Swahili fluently. Uh, I speak enough French to be able to read and, and understand what's going on there um, and Dutch um, so I can understand Afrikaans as well. But when it comes to, for example, we have a lot of items in Hausa, in Igbo, in um, in Kenya, Rwanda, in Uganda, all these different languages. And sometimes you you uh, have to catalog an item and you're looking at it and you're trying to figure out what language is this in? <laughs> so it's one of those so challenges. You, it, it, when that happens, do you kind of take the item around the office and say, hey, everybody, what's this? <laughs> I mean, what do you do? Well, it's it's great if it's in Amharic or a language that is is uh, an Ethiopian language, because then I could just go straight to Eup and be like Eup. Um, what? <laughs> or if it's an Arabic script, because we also have a lot of items. Like for example, almost well, all of our Swahili uh, manuscripts actually are in uh, a Jemi Swahili, so they're in Swahili but in Arabic script. So um, those are a little bit easier because you can go to uh, people who speak Arabic within the office. Um, and then you can also decipher, because a lot of them are in Arabic, but at the same time, they have either in the margins, um, uh, the Swahili terms. So that is easier to decipher. Um, with languages that um, are not spoken within the library, and many of the African languages are not spoken in the African library uh, in the in the library. So with those, there are actually materials that there's a very handy little blue book. Um, I have it like down <laughs> next to me on my desk, but there's a handy little blue book that just talks uh, that looks at um, all these sort of language, uh, all this sort of uh, terms. Like for example, kitabu is a book in Swahili um, or Andika or is also to write. So it will have all these African languages and terms that you'll find within books like Ndi is uh, by in uh, Seychellois Creole. So it helps so you can pick apart which, which part of uh, the book. Uh, so I'll say like published and stuff like that. So um, you'll you'll decipher which language it is based on that little blue book and also just searching and researching around. Well, thank you so much for that really fascinating insight into the sort of detective work that you do. Hanlin and Yasio, would you do you, would you like to contribute? Hanlin, you're the first. Uh, so uh, yes, as the age of Emory just say, it's one of the difficulties. Uh, but this is also what makes our job and work very interesting and quite um, energetic is we can come across various different of materials, language, um, days by days. 
Uh, if I have to say one of the difficulties really in my job is when you see the items, uh, it, the conditions is not really well to <laughs> provide the original access to the readers and the readers is really enthusiastic to the original items. We have the responsibilities to looking after the items, but we also really hope the the researchers or readers who really want to see it are able to see it. So really <laughs> the most difficult part is we need to protect the collections, but also need to provide access. But um so would it just arrive in the post? Do you just get a kind of a big lumpy post bag every day and go, oh, what's here? <laughs> Uh, not every day, but I would say quite frequently we have the we receive the readers uh, ask questions from readers say, can you help about this? What is they say? So not only for the British Library's items, we also provide like help with the general audience or visitors questions, even it's not library's items. <laughs> yes, you are over to you. Just uh, two more minutes, please. Okay. I think we colleagues from the Asian African collection, as Ayob mentioned, we represent over the language area and we are very much specialized to the cultural aspect where we represent. So I would think as the British Library has the flagship motto, world knowledge in the UK, in the British Library, we represent our country. Ayob is a uh, mini Ethiopia. Mariam is a mini Africa, south of the Sahara. And um, like uh, Handing is a mini China and I'm a mini Japan. So the expectation to us is we should have known everything about <laughs> our area. And uh, we do our best to cover to fulfill the expectation. And uh, when we come to the international relationship because we work with the international partner. When I go to Japan, I need to switch my thinking is now I'm a representing of the British Library um, in Japan. So a kind of the balance of international relationship and the plus my duty or our, our responsibility in the British Library it's sometimes we need to make sure where we are standing. Now we are standing in the UK and promoting Japan. Then I'm standing in Japan promoting British Library and the UK. So that is um, something we need to be fairly balanced and it's a quite a challenge, but exciting as well. That's why we love our job. The love for your job has all been made evident in this presentation today. I'm very grateful to you all for, for joining us and sharing the work that includes diplomacy and detective work. It's been absolutely brilliant to hear from you all. Um, I'd like to remind our audience that we have another session um, at the same time next week, 12.30 on Thursday, the 23rd of June, and that will be with the British Library's Americas and Europe team. Um, which is the, uh, the exhibition Breaking the News is open now. So if you're anywhere near London, do come in for a visit. And there are lots more news related events on our website. But in the meantime, I'd just like to wholeheartedly thank the curators, Yasuo, Hanlin, Eob and Mariam. Thank you very much. And uh, audience, see you all next time. Goodbye.